You know, brethren, we are so blessed in the church. We have so much musical talent. And uh, I just, uh, listening to that piece of music, and it just seems so appropriate and uh, very well done. Thank you, Gabriella. That was uh, a nice offering. Thank you. That was very, very well done. I had to, I was sitting there a little earlier, and I had to kind of laugh at myself. You know, uh, self-doubt and vanity, a lot of times, are two sides of the same coin. Uh, a few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to speak in Fort Worth, and I got there, and uh, uh, I looked around, come to find out about three-quarters of the church had left town. And the thought hit my mind, oh, no, they must have heard I was coming to speak. Huh? <laughs> then this afternoon, I kind of look around, and the place is filling up with people and faces I haven't seen in a long time. And, of course, the first thought that hit my mind is, hey, yeah, well, they must have heard I was going to speak this afternoon. <laughs> in the case of Fort Worth, that was the weekend for the Houston basketball tournament. And I looked up and saw uh, Brenda Hogg. Oh, Boots Goose, of course, that's what they're So, you know, there's a story about a man who loved to fly fish. And uh, being from Dallas, he didn't have many local opportunities for that particular sport. He, from time to time, would go up into... Oh, the southeastern Oklahoma, I understand there's an opportunity up there. Uh, fly fishing is fairly common in the rapids up there. His favorite place was uh, down on the Llano River, at least within driving distance, his favorite place was down on the Llano River, which is just north of uh, San Antonio. And um, he would uh, meet friends down there from time to time. He had a, apparently he had a favorite spot that he used to really like to go to. And he had it identified, and the, and the landmark for this spot was a big uh, native pecan tree that was across the river and diametrically across the river from where he liked to uh, uh, enter the uh, river. And apparently about, oh, two-thirds or maybe a third of the way into the river, uh, there was a large rock. And it was under the water, and uh, if you didn't know it was there, you know, you couldn't see it necessarily. But he had uh, found that, that big rock, and he found that if he got behind the rock and let the water break around him, he could stand there in the flow of water and fish for quite a long time. And it, you know, it wasn't tiring for him, and he wasn't having to fight the water as as he was fishing. As the story goes, he uh, had plans to go down one weekend, and he called down and, uh, to his friends in that area, and they said, no, don't come, don't come. We've had a lot of heavy rains in the area. The Lano is really swollen, lots of water coming down. There's rocks and there's logs and there's lots of debris. It just wouldn't be safe, and besides that, the fishing would be uh, would be lousy, so don't come down uh, for a couple of weeks. And so he postponed, and sure enough, a couple, three weeks later, he uh, joined friends down there, and uh, uh, sure enough, he uh, scouted up and down the river and found the pecan tree and went in the water. And uh, he had gone to the normal spot for the rock only to find that the rock was missing. Instead, there was a very large hole that the water had dug out. And so he took a step, like he'd always done, fell down in the hole. Apparently his waders filled up with water. The water swept him under and the current swept him under. And it took him downstream and his body was never found. We'll come back to that story in just a minute. There's more to it. Interesting PBS 
show the other day I saw. I expect it's one of those shows that be repeated. It was about, uh, uh, parts of it anyway, about uh, uh, liberty ships. Liberty ships were kind of freighters that uh, were built during World War II. Uh, the fact is they built them from 1941 through 1945. They built about 11, 1,200 of these ships, and uh, they were designed and built specifically to take uh, men and materials from America into Europe during the war. And uh, uh, I found it interesting. They turned one of these ships out about once a month and uh, had different, had building them in different shipyards, of course, and they were turning out one a month and, and they were able to build these for around $2 million a piece, which I, in today's terms, I mean, that's cheap. And uh, what's interesting about them is that the uh, merchant marines, of course, uh, were responsible for manning these uh, ships. And uh, the life expectancy of one of these ships after the German U-boats got through with it was one trip. The Navy was pleased if they could get one one-way trip per boat out of one of these uh, uh, Liberty ships. Of course, it's a huge cost in men's lives. Uh, didn't know this, the merchant marines had the highest per capita uh, loss of, man, of men's lives of any military service in World War II. Who knew? I didn't, under, didn't know that. You know, the term liberty has, is an important term and it comes up in many ways. Uh, uh, a little earlier, uh, Mr. Vaughn mentioned the episodes that the violence that occurred in, in France. And the term liberty came out in the French news uh, on several occasions uh, following that. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about liberty. Let's look at James 1, verse 22. James 1, verse 22. It reads... But be you doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. Verse 24, for he beholds himself, and goes his way, and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. Verse 25, but whosoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Christ uh, also spoke about liberty. You'll remember the episode when he was very early in his ministry, and he was at the synagogue, and he was asked to read a passage, and that passage happened to be Isaiah 61 1. We see that event in Luke 4, verse 18, where they had handed him the scroll, and Christ read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised. Brethren, before we can actually get into discussing what Christ meant there by the term using the, the term liberty, we have to stop just a moment and look at how liberty became an important issue for the early church. You know, the thing that strikes me, after the death of Christ, when you look at the writings of Paul and Peter and John, Jude, James, you look at those, you're, or I am struck by how much is said about the attacks on the church that started up and how much that had to be addressed in these men's writings. And there seem to be attacks from, at least the way I, I kind of define them, two different groups of people. Uh, first of all, there were those who seemed to be really intimidated 
by the church's expansion to include the Gentiles or the non-Jewish converts. While on one hand, they appeared to be okay with the idea and they could make peace with the idea of non-Jewish converts being part of the church, yet at the same time, they seemed to want to put obstacles in these people's way and the tool they used or the obstacle they used was the uh, practice of, of circumcision. Brethren, as a reminder about this practice, let's go and look at Genesis 17 where there God was making a covenant with Abraham and as a sign or a symbol or a token of that covenant, he instituted the practice of circumcision. Genesis 17, 2. God was saying to Abraham, I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be a father of many nations. Neither shall your name any more be Abram, but your name now shall be Abraham for a father of many nations have I made you. And I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to the God unto you and your seed after you. And I will give unto you and unto your seed after you the land wherein you are a stranger and all the land of Canaan for the everlasting possession and I will be their God. Verse 9. And God said unto Abraham, You shall keep my covenant therefore you and your seed after you in their generations. And then verse 10, this is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your seed. After you, every man child among you shall be circumcised in your circumcision, and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant between me and you. You know, brethren, when you just look at that, it's pretty ominous. One, the covenant. Two, the symbol of the covenant. But the story doesn't end right there. You know, Moses, he wrote Genesis. Genesis primarily is a history of what was going on, starting with uh, all the way back to the creation events uh, all the way through to uh, uh, the period just before ancient Israel arose, but giving that, he gave that history of what had occurred and the opportunities that people were given in the initial introduction God made to mankind through uh, Abraham. But Moses also wrote Deuteronomy, and there is, we look at a book that is not just history, but it's also a primer. It contains lessons and teachings. We see in Deuteronomy 10, verse 12, Moses wrote, and now Israel, he's talking to Israel. What does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes which I command you this day, behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord your God, the earth also, wherewithal there is in. Verse 15, only the Lord hath a delight in your fathers to love them. He chose their seed after them, even you above all people as it is this day. And in verse 16, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. Moses understood 
that the covenant of circumcision was a symbolic and that its actual application was always understood to be subject to change. We see later in Deuteronomy, there's actually a prophecy that Moses gave about Israel. By this time in his dealings with Israel, he very likely understood things are not going to go well with these folks. These guys are just too stiff-necked and they are just stubborn and they're just going to do it their own way. I can see that. But then I'm sure that God actually kind of helped him to understand even more because we see in Deuteronomy 30 a prophecy. Verse 1, And it shall come to pass that when all these things are come upon you, the blessings and the curse which I have set before you, you will call them to mind among the nations. Among the nations? What, what's that mean? Moses was saying and he was telling Israel, we've laid out blessings and we've laid out cursings if you fail to keep God's law. And he's saying right here, you're not going to you're not going to measure up. You are going to be taken and dispersed into the wind and scattered among all nations. Continuing verse 2, and shall return unto the Lord your God and shall obey his voice according to all that I command you this day, you and your children, with all your heart and with all your soul, that then the Lord your God will turn your captivity. And this is talking about an end time event. Turn your captivity and have compassion on you and return and gather you from all nations for the Lord your God has scattered you. Verse 4, And if any, if any of thine be driven into the uttermost parts of heaven from there, the Lord your God will gather you, and from thence he will fetch you. Verse 5, And the Lord your God will bring you into a land which your fathers possessed, and you will possess it, and he will do you good, and multiply you above your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. Jeremiah understood also in the broader sense that the Old Testament covenant would also be subject to change. Jeremiah 31, 31 it reads, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with your fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband to them, says the Lord. Verse 33, But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after these days, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. You know, brethren, if we come forward now into Paul's time, Paul was clearly having to contend with a very serious controversy regarding physical circumcision. There were people probably there who really didn't quite understand, didn't quite get the idea that Christ brought a new covenant. Perhaps there were those who just genuinely were trying to keep non-Jewish converts out of the church and insisted that converts then observe the Abraham covenant of circumcision. We see in Philippians 3 verse 2, Paul had to write, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. These are people who are preaching a physical circumcision and a continuation of that practice. Verse 3, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit 
and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Then in Galatians, the book of Galatians, brethren, is just from front to back, is addressing this very subject. Galatians 5, verse 1, Stand therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the whole law. Verse 4, Christ is become of no effect to you, whosoever of you were justified by that law, and you have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Verse 6, for in Jesus Christ neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which works by love. In Romans, again, these Gentile churches, one after the other, had people go into those churches and, and insist that those uh, that the physical act of circumcision was required for converts. Again, in Romans 2, verse 28, for he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward of the flesh. For he is a Jew which is one inwardly, in circumcision that of the heart in the spirit, and not in the letter whose praise is not of men, but of God. And then finally in Colossians, Colossians 2, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men or the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Verse 10, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. And in verse 11, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of sin of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Brethren, Paul understood and he preached that circumcision was no longer relevant in the context of new converts coming into the New Testament church. You know, I'd mentioned a little earlier that there were two groups of people who I felt that were causing troubles for the church and attacking the church. One group was folks who were at least nominally part of the church and trying to uh, 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 insert a, uh, an Old Testament doctrine. But then there was another group, brethren, and this group that attacked the church argued that the observance of the law of God was simply no longer necessary. In Jude, Jude is just one thin chapter. It was a letter. You'll find it immediately uh, before Revelation in your Bible. But it's um, pretty profound when you understand why it was written and what it's addressing. Because the church was undergoing attacks by people who were trying to tear it apart. Jude, verse 3, Beloved, I give all diligence to write to you of the common salvation and it's needful for me to write to you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Verse 4, for there are certain men who crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, denying that the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Jude is saying that there are people coming into the church who have waited in the wings, perhaps for generations, prepared specifically to insert a doctrine into the church and to use that to tear the church apart. You know, Peter faced 
similar opposition. Second Peter 2, verse 1. That there were false prophets also among the people, even as there were false teachers among you, who privately bring in damnable heresies, even denying that the Lord had bought them and bring themselves into swift destruction. Verse 2, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, and by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Continuing in verse 18, for when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they lure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that are clean escaped from them who live in error, while they promise them liberty, worldly liberty, brethren. They're offering them a liberty. They themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome of the same is brought into bondage. Further down through the time, we need to go back to uh, give a thought to Paul's writings. Down through time, people have kind of picked through Paul's writings. But what's interesting, they typically always kind of come back to the law. And what, what can they show in Paul's writings that diminish the law and diminish our responsibility to observe and to keep it? And they point to places, for example, like Galatians 2, verse 16. Again, keeping in mind that Paul in Galatians was addressing circumcision and its application in the spiritual sense in the church. He wasn't addressing the law at large. He was dealing with one subject there. Galatians 2, verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Boy, you take that, just that. You just lift that out. Go no further. Don't look any deeper into Paul's teachings. And you can really misconstrue what's being said there. You know, years ago, the locals have heard my stories of growing up in the panhandle, vast distances, and at night you'd be driving from one place to the other and listen to the radio, and when I was a little boy or a young man, uh, there were a lot of radio preachers on. I don't think they're on as near as much now. But uh, and you'd drive along and you'd listen to them. Brethren, I would hear them pick these verses out and make statements like, this proves that the law is nailed to the cross. And phrases like, once saved, always saved. And they would just grind on and on about that. But brethren, that's not what Paul said. Paul is very clear. Again, you've got to look at Paul's writings and understand the context of what he's saying. Paul was very clear that while salvation is through Christ, we are not relieved of the responsibility to observe and to keep God's law. Romans 5, verse 13. Paul defines what sin is. Sin is not imputed when there is no law. Law defines sin. Romans 6, verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Then he asks a question, a very important question. He doesn't stop right there. He asks a question. Verse 15, what then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. No, of course not. Verse 23, a verse that has been used in pulpits of the church of God thousands of times. Romans 6, 23, for wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Remember a little earlier, we were looking at Christ's comments about the reason he came. Let's look at that one more time. He actually explained his purpose. Luke 4, verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord was upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty 
them who are bruised. Christ explained elsewhere, too, exactly what he meant. John 17, 17, again, a very familiar verse, time when Christ was praying, praying about the church, praying about the disciples. John 17, 17, sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. John 8, verse 31, he said, Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, keep in mind, brethren, that Christ said elsewhere in John, John 10, 30, I think it is, that I and my Father are one. So here in verse 31 of John 8, He's saying, if you continue in my word, he therefore is saying, if you continue in God's word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You could say, it will liberate you. It will set you at liberty. Let's look again at James. We read this earlier, but let's, let's look again at James 1, verse 22. But be you doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in the glass. For he beholds himself and goes his way and straightforward forgets what manner of man he was. Verse 25, but whosoever looks at the perfect law of liberty, God's law, and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. You know, brethren, you can always count on David when it comes to a discussion of the law of God and the precepts and the statutes and the judgments. We see in Psalms 119, verse 41, let your mercies come also unto me, O Lord, even your salvation according to your word. So shall I have wherewithal to answer him that reproaches me, for I trust in your word. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped, and I hope in your judgments. So shall I keep your law continually, forever and ever in verse 45 and I will walk at liberty for I seek your precepts brethren when it comes to this subject what does it mean in practical terms for you and I I always like to insert that if I can in a message because I think it's important to take something away when you leave here, something that maybe you can use. So on a practical level, what does the term liberty mean for you and I? Let's go back to our fishermen. You know, I said that he had stepped into the river and he would stepped into that hole his waders apparently filled up with water. The water sucked him in under. The current took him down the river and his body was never found. That, in fact, is true. Because he didn't drown. Oh, he was beaten up. He hit a few rocks and a few bare, you know, stumps under the water and, and all. But somewhere downstream, he actually made it to the edge and kind of pulled himself and crawled out onto the riverbank. Now, why is that relevant to this? Let me explain. You see, our fishermen couldn't swim. Never could swim. This guy had no buoyancy at all. Get in the swimming pool, he went right to the bottom. Stayed out of swimming pool, never took a bath, always showered. He understood. He just understood. On top of that, when you 
get a body of moving water. He understood there were laws of buoyancy, hydrodynamics, and gravity, all of which worked against him. At first blush, you would think that his hobby was really inconsistent with his limitations. This is what's relevant to you and I, brethren. He understood he was vulnerable. He understood he was in danger. Brethren, you and I, in the spiritual sense, face decisions that test our resolve to live by God's law and to accept God's promise of liberty. Now, our fisherman, he chose to work with those laws. Over the years, he had a various uh, types of, used to be called life preservers. You know, these basically, you strap big pieces of styrofoam on you, and, and that was always bulky and uh, inconvenient. And uh, he would do it, but he never did like it. And, uh, you know, he was in Europe one time, though, years and years ago. And he ran on to an inflatable flotation device. Interesting little piece of equipment. They're all over the place now. You can find them here in the States all over. But at that time, the only place he ever saw it was Europe. And he bought one. It's an interesting thing. looks like a big deflated bicycle in, inner tube. Put it over the neck, bring it down, kind of strap it around uh, the waist. And it's actually, it remains deflated until it's necessary. And what it has, it has a little valve that you insert a CO2 cartridge into. And when you need it, uh, you can, some, some models have a manual tab that you can reach down and jerk and it'll inflate it and, and uh, up you come. Um, some models like his uh, are a little more sophisticated in that the valve, if it goes underwater and stays underwater for five seconds, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi, it automatically pops, inflates, and up you come. It's a great little device. You know, brethren, because he observed these physical laws at work. Something interesting. Keep in mind, he didn't argue with them. He didn't rationalize around them. He didn't pretend they didn't exist or they don't apply to me. He just observed them, accepted them, and worked with them. And as a result, he had the liberty to enjoy his hobby. Brethren, we have something very similar spiritually working on our behalf. God's law is our lifeline and our source of liberty. I saw a really sad, and this is actually, this is actually true. I really saw, I saw a very sad news item the other day. You know, on Saturday nights, about eight or nine o'clock, there are, on several of the channels, uh, there's this the news magazine type formatted shows. And the other night there was a, uh, a segment about a uh, young man in his mid to late 40s, top executive with Google, ran an entire division, and he didn't come home one night, didn't show up for, wasn't home the next day. And they got to looking for him. They found him on the floor of his yacht. And subsequent tests shown that he had died from an overdose of black tar heroin. You know, brother, kind of a sad thing. The guy was a high techie. And his boat was just filled with cameras and different things. So the police, and unfortunately his own family, 
got to watch the entire thing take place. They watched the injection. They watched the man fall on the floor. They watched a prostitute stand over him with a glass of wine. And when she was finished with that, she stepped over his body and walked out, leaving, there in, leaving him there in convulsions. You know, brethren, this young man would have benefited and appreciated the liberty he could have had under God's law. His wife and three children would have appreciated, too, the benefits and the gift of having their husband and father come home because he had observed and they had benefited from the liberty of God's law. His parents would have appreciated and benefited from his observance, having their son come home and participate in their families because he had observed and benefited from the liberty of law, law of liberty. His siblings, they would have had their brother, his friends and co-workers, they too would have benefited directly and indirectly from the law of liberty. Instead, the executive chose a worldly liberty that was talked about earlier in Second Peter. Worldly liberty is free. It's freely given, and it's available. It just is very expensive. Brethren, I'll conclude with just one final comment, and just to summarize, that to the extent that we walk with God's law as our guide. We will enjoy the immediate benefits of the liberty from an accumulation of penalties of disobedience. And in the long term, we will have the liberty of eternal life and a future as members in God's family.